Okay, so I'm going to talk about being disciplined with Elm today. So my name is Charlie Coster, if you don't know me. Uh, I'm a software engineer for a company called Aventure here in Omaha. And that's my Twitter handle, uh, ccoster22, so you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I like tweeting about functional JavaScript stuff because that's super interesting to me. So one of my goals uh, in this talk was to, within the first 30 seconds, just, just show you Elm so you're not waiting for you know, 15 minutes to figure out what the heck I'm talking about. So this is Elm, and I'm just going to show you the behavior just to uh, explain uh, what it's doing here first. So Elm is a functional reactive programming language that compiles to JavaScript. So what that means is it's a functional language for the web. Um, so you can see in this example, I, I move my cursor around and this triangle you know, follows, it rotates to, to point at my, the hexagon. So th this is a canvas, uh, and so uh, if you try and think about what it would take to do this in JavaScript, you'd have some HTML template with a canvas element in JavaScript. You would use some selector to get a reference to that canvas, get the context, create some shapes, store a reference to that, and on, on mouse move, you know, update the positions, right? Uh, Elm is nothing like that. Elm is a functional language and it's a declarative language. So I don't expect you to completely uh, understand what's going on here. I'll blow that up a little bit. But there's some, there's some neat takeaways we can take away from this. Uh, so for example, uh, we see we have some declarative references to mouse position and window dimensions. So there's no add event listener mouse move, remove event listener, there's no event management there. Uh, you see we have a main function and the, another function called scene. You see that it's taking in an x, y, and a width and a height. Um, again, I know that it's, you're not going to understand this completely, and we'll, we'll get into some of these details. Uh, you see something like something up here called a collage, and it's creating an ngon3100. Okay, well, what does that mean? You could actually go out to elmlang.org slash examples and go out and play with this. So if I change my, my ngon3 to an ngon4 and change it from blue to red, and I recompile it, you can see that my three gone became a four gone, so it's, it's very, very descriptive of what it's trying to do. And so this is Elm, and this is what we're going to talk about. And uh, but before we get there, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. So you can Google for Elm presentations online, and what you'll find are a lot of buzzword-like phrases like this, like Elm has no runtime exceptions, undefined isn't a thing, enforced semantic versioning, virtual DOM for fast rendering, and so on, time travel debugger. And yes, all those are true about, about Elm, and all of, the, all of those are amazing, but I wanted you to take something more away from this talk than just buzzwords. I, I wanted you to understand or explain the, the core problem that Elm is trying to solve, how it solves it, and then we'll get into some of the, the cool features that, uh, that we have listed up here. So like I said, Elm is a functional reactive programming language. Uh, and I realize not everyone might understand or know how to define that, so the, for the first 10 minutes here I want to define what FRP is, so that we all have just a general understanding of, of what that means, uh, and then how we do that in JavaScript, and then finally we'll get into the really sweet features about Elm. Um, so what is FRP? Uh, it's actually uh, really intimidating to try and stand up here and comfortably talk about this in front of people because it's it's a big, scary term, uh, but I did see something on Twitter today that someone was excited to learn about FRP, so that's, so at least two people in this room are excited about <laughs> FRP, so that, they gave me some confidence. Um, functional reactive programming, so does anyone in here use, uh, have, have they ever used a virtual DOM library like React.js? Or uh, an immutable library like Immutable JS, or just ES6, right? And a few of you have, or observables with RxJS, right? So, a, a few of you are nodding your head, and those all solve a subset of functional reactive programming. And the reason for that is because this is my definition of FRP. It's just combining functional programming techniques with reactive programming techniques. And those libraries that I just listed off there solve some subset of that problem in, in some way. And so, we're going to look at it from a more holistic perspective here. So what is functional programming? A lot of people will answer this. It has something to do with map, filter, and reduce. These are functions that you'll find on the, on the array object. And th that's actually not correct. That's not what functional programming is about. Functional programming is about three things. More than that, but at a high level, it's about higher order functions. So functions as a first class citizen, stateless functions, and immutable data. So, Higher order functions, it's like treating functions as variables. So you can pass a function into a function, you could return a function from a function. So if you've ever used a callback, you've used a, a function in a higher order way. 
Uh, and I assume we all know what the mutable data is. If you don't, it's a variable that can't change. It's a constant. Um, but what about stateless functions? These are sometimes known as pure functions, and I'm going to show a few examples of, of what a stateless function is. So a stateless function is a function in kind of a mathematical sense. Not necessarily that it has to do math, but in the sense that it, when you run a mathematical function on a calculator, when you give it the same two inputs and you hit equals, it'll always produce the same output without any other side effects. And so that's what a stateless function is, is you give it the same inputs and you always get the same output. As soon as you introduce side effects, it is no longer a stateless function. It is no longer a pure function. It is impure. And so if I do some HTTP request in the middle of the function, that's bad. That's a side effect. And now we've got state problems. Uh, other ways to make a function not stateless is to, is to mutate a variable outside of its inner scope there. So uh, uh, changing total is a side effect, and that's bad. We, we don't want to do that in functional programming. Um, one other aspect of stateless functions is that they're composable. So if I, if I have this function called increment array, and I pass it an array and an integer, which should add that number to each element in a new array that gets returned, I should be able to call that over and over again and uh, get, a new, get the same, get this array every time. Um, and I can just tell by looking at the, the function def the definition up there whether it's a stateless function. So I know sum is a stateless function. I know that the way that we're using array.map is being used in a stateless way, and because that's the entire body of increment array, we know increment array is stateless. And so the idea that we, that we want to do is we want to write as much of our applications as possible in a, with stateless functions, with composed stateless functions. So the question you might have on your mind is, well then, how do we do effects? How do we do side effects? How do we do AJAX requests and so on? And the answer has something to do, to do with reactive programming. So what is reactive programming? Uh, reactive programming, uh, according to Andre Staltz, is uh, programming with asynchronous data streams. Um, and by the way, Andre Staltz, he's the creator of CycleJS. And so just kind of as, as a side note, if at the end of this talk, uh, Elm, you don't think Elm's quite for you, but you appreciate the concepts and the benefits you get from Elm, uh, CycleJS is more of a reactive version of FRP. It has a time travel debugger, so if you want to stay in JavaScript land, uh, that's something that I think you should look into. So what is this asynchronous data stream? That's this big fancy word. Well, we more commonly know that as uh, observables, and which is what the concept uh, that RxJS gives us. Um, so an observable is, is nothing complicated. It's simply, here we have two observables. It's simply a container that holds a value that can change over time. And so time is going on to the right, and this observable up here has one, and then has two, and then has three. These are values on that observable. You can run different operations on observables. So if I uh, have a reference to that observable, and I call map on it, and passing it a callback that transforms the data, it will produce a new observable that every time data pops onto the first one, it will automatically transform it to data onto the second observable. And you can also subscribe to observables. So every time an event pops on there, you can subscribe to it and run some callback. And so, uh, Rx Marbles is a, a nifty website where I got this graphic from. It, it's, a, it's a good website to, if you're a visual learner, how to understand the different operations and the ways they interact with an observable. If you're more of a, I need to see the code, so just show me the code. Here's the code example. Uh, can you read that in the back row? Yes, good. Um, so this is an example, a mostly complete example of a, an autocomplete box. So you have uh, an input box, and you're typing in and it suggests words for you. And those first two lines, we're asking RxJS to create some observable on our input box based on key up events. So basically, we're, we're creating one of these things where instead of one, two, three, it's key up event, key up event, key up event every time the user releases the key. And so then what we do is we run a few operations on it. We de debounce it so we don't get too many events. Uh, we map over that observable to get the input box values into an observable. Filter out input text strings that are too short, and then filter out ones that are, that are duplicated. And after we do all that once, we have an observable with filtered content that we can subscribe to. And so uh, in our callback for that subscription, we do some request, and on response, we, we update the DOM. And if you've ever had to do this by hand, any kind of type ahead or autocomplete example, you know how big of a pain in the ass this is, right? If you don't use observables, because you, you have to manage state, uh, you have to use like set timeout and clear timeout to, to throttle the data, and that's, that's super annoying. Um, you have to deal with race conditions. Uh, by, by the way, this has a race condition in it, so don't go steal this from my slides and put it in production, uh, because you will have a race condition. Uh, 
Also, I will post these slides online uh, after this talk uh, in case you were wondering about that. Okay, so once more, what is FRP? FRP is from the perspective of the outside world looking in, your entire application is a big stateless function. And, and I don't mean that literally. You can, stateless functions are composable. You can break them up into smaller pieces. But from the outside world looking in, you have inputs that go into your application, they trickle through your application, and they produce effects. And the in inputs are wired up. This is the reactive part. These are the observables or the data streams. Uh, so we have asynchronous data streams coming into our application, feeding us events from the outside world, and we have asynchronous data streams coming out, uh, giving our effects out to the outside world to, to influence the browser or some server. And the effects we're producing down here, they're not side effects. These are not HTTP requests or DOM manipulations. These are descriptions of, of what we want to have it. Want to happen. So, for example, virtual DOM is a description of what we want the DOM to look like. It is not mutations to the DOM. So, it's an important distinction there. And then, when we plug in our server and our user, it, that closes the loop, and this is what FRP is. Uh, at least, this is the one particular formation of FRP. And programming in this way has uh, a lot of useful benefits. For one, when you use stateless functions, uh, it removes state management problems. Uh, you no longer have components talking to each other, and, and that's hard to keep track of. No longer, you no longer have cascading changes. Uh, stateless functions are really easy to test because you don't have to mock up promises. You don't have to mock up HTTP requests in your unit test. That, that's, that's really annoying to, to, to try and manage. Data is flowing in one direction, so you, it's just easier to understand from that perspective. And uh, this sets you up for like a, a state machine, turning your application into a state machine. So that, that, that sets you up for things like a time travel debugger, which I mentioned Elm has and, and CycleJS has. So how do we do functional reactive programming in JavaScript today, or little pieces of it at least? Um, so stateless functions, we don't really have libraries or tools for that. It's just, it's on us, the developer, to, to write functions in, in a stateless way. Uh, there's libraries for immutable data, for example, immutable JS, we have types, React.js for virtual DOM, data streams, we've talked about RxJS, and there's, there's Flux and Redux to, to enforce the unidirectional pattern. And, and I'm sure I've, I've offended someone by not putting your favorite library up here. <laughs> I apologize, there's, there's only so much room I can put on the slide. Um, but th there's a problem with this picture. Uh, it's not that I'm crappy at doing slides, and, and right, it's, it's, the problem is JavaScript. It's, sorry. I said that wrong. The problem is not JavaScript. <laughs> yeah, don't say that at a Nebraska JS meeting. <laughs> Rookie mistake. No, the problem is not JavaScript. The problem is are not these libraries. These libraries are great in theory. The way if we use these libraries correctly, they should work great. The problem is us. That's a much better answer than JavaScript. The problem is us because let's face it. Let's say. Uh, you're in production and there's a fire to put out and this fire is costing your company thousands of dollars as every minute passes. Um, what do you do, right? You go in there, look at the, find, find what you need to fix, hack something together and push it out. And we, we break some paradigm. Maybe we use jQuery with virtual DOM and completely break that paradigm. Or let's say you have a project manager or customer breathing down your neck uh, because there's some looming deadline coming. What do we do, right? We, we cut corners, we, we fail at discipline, and we create global functions or global variables that get mutated and washed everywhere. Or uh, we mutate a flux store because you're not supposed to actually mutate a flux store that breaks the unidirectionality. Um, and so the, the problem is, is human discipline. And you can probably guess where I'm going with this. Elm takes the human out of the picture and replaces it with a compiler. Because it, it's a FRP language built from the ground up with, with a synth syntax and these concepts built into it, it'll compile the JavaScript. And if you try to break any one of these paradigms, they'll say, nope, I'm not going to show anything. Here's a friendly error message. You cannot, you cannot run this program. And so uh, that is the, the crux of the problem that I wanted to explain is Elm, Elm keeps us from losing the benefits of FRP. Um, so it's, that was the, uh, the core problem there. So let's actually get into to some of the fun things about Elm now. So the first thing I mentioned was undefined is gone, which is amazing. So it's replaced by a, a strong type system, uh, which we can kind of imagine, right? It'll make sure you don't 
think a variable is a string, but then use it as a number, or it'll make sure you, you call your functions with passing arguments in the right order. Um, it also has the concept, concept of a maybe, which I'm going to try the best I can to not use the word monad at all. So that's the last time I will use that word. It's like Voldemort. I'm, I'm not going to use that word anymore. Um, but I'm going to explain what a maybe is. So here's a very simple Elm application. Um, let me throw it up a little bit. Uh, so I have a main application that calls get first value, passing in a list, takes the return value and pipes it into a, a core function called text that returns virtual DOM. And so you see our implementation of get first value, it accepts a list and calls list ahead on it. So it, it returns the zeroth item of that list, so item at index zero, and it should display to the screen. And if we look at, if we try to compile this, this actually is not a valid uh, Elm application. Uh, the Elm compiler is, is saying, uh, you gave me a maybe number, but I was expecting a string. And so not only did we not convert our number to a string because it's strongly typed, we didn't convert our maybe number to a number. So what is this maybe number concept? Well, if you think about what list.head should return, in JavaScript, if you try to access the item at index zero of an array, you'll get undefined. Elm doesn't have undefined. So what should list.head do? Well, list.head wraps the return value into this container that says, well, it could either be the value you want or it could be nothing at all. And you have to unwrap it to, to figure out what's in there. And so don't read too much into it. I mean, this is the, the actual definition for maybe. There's something called a union type in Elm, which is kind of like a enumeration on steroids, where maybe, maybe A, so maybe number is either just that number you're talking about or it's nothing at all. Again, don't read too much into it. Boolean is a type. It can be true or false. Our applications usually have actions, which there's an enumeration of the types of actions we can have in our L programs. Um, so if we look at the, the right way to handle this, uh, main stays the same, but this time when we call list.head, we cache into a variable called uh, maybe first value, and then we have a sort of a, a switch expression where we basically say, okay, unwrap this maybe, look at the, all the possible values that it could be, if it's just a number, we're going to return a number uh, converted to a string. Otherwise, if it's nothing, return a set of uh, an empty string. And now, that'll always work. No matter what kind of list I pass it, as long as it's a, a list of integers, uh, if it's zero length or a length of 100, it'll always work. It'll never fail. So that's a, a really neat guarantee that, that maybes give us. Uh, the type system and the compiler have other neat features. So, for example, uh, I can create my own, my own custom type and say, I'm going to define a type of a type alias of person. So I'm going to have certain variables that fit that shape. Uh, here's guy. Guy is a variable of type person. And here's the values that I'm filling in for him. Um, I can also use that in a function. So I'll get full name for is a function. It takes in a person and it returns, it, it returns a string. So for a given person, I return the first name and the last name appended to each other. But if you look at what I did here, there's a typo, which is, you know, you can do this in JavaScript and it'll return undefined. Again, Elm, no undefined. And what it'll do is the compiler will say, hey, you told me you're giving me a function where it accepts a person and returns a string. More specifically, you're going to give me something that had a last name, but you gave me something that had a last in and me. Well, by the way, I compared the record fields and found some potential typos. So the, I mean, the, the compiler does, does has a typo check here. It'll say, did you mean last name? And so it's... Uh, I think it's, not only does it make sure you don't do undefined uh, or have undefined values, but it'll uh, have typo checking and other useful features. So that, uh, I really like the, the compiler if, if you haven't noticed. And it's weird to say that, but until you use it, it's, it's really awesome. Um, what did I click on? Virtual DOM. Virtual DOM, right? Uh, so Elm has virtual DOM, which means that it's very declarative and very performant. And in this example, you almost don't even have to look at the right side of the screen to know what's going on here, right? Because you see this main, and main says, okay, I have a red hexagon, I have a pur purple hexagon that's twice as big, a green hexagon that's shifted 100 pixels to the right, and a blue hexagon that's rotated 30 degrees. And that's exactly what you see there. So you see, this is what Virtual DOM gives you. It's just a very declarative description of what you want to display, not how you want to display it. Question? Is, is that using like Canvas or something to render the... Yeah, whenever you see collage in Elm, that means Canvas. Okay. Um, and we will get to a, a, a non-Canvas example. So it's, it's the full realm of, of displaying an HTML. All right, so that is virtual DOM. Um, I think next is signals. Okay, so before I move on to signals, I want to point out something in this example here. 
Uh, we annotate our main function and we say it's going to return an element, which is that collage right there. Um, and so this is not a very reactive example, right? It's just static. It's just render wants it and do nothing else. There's no reactivity. And so uh, in order to incorporate reactivity, Element introduces us to a concept called signals. And that is our asynchronous data stream concept. And so the best way I know how to explain signals is to compare it to something that we've already talked about, which are observables. And you may already be familiar with observables. So just to contrast the two, uh, observables have a life cycle. You programmatically create them, they live for some amount of time, and then they finish, they, they die, and they get garbage collected. Signals are static. You'll know at compile time where every possible signal in your application will be. So there's one, that's one difference. Um, observables live in a not strong type language, so they can return whatever they want, whereas signals are in a strongly typed language, so they can only return a value of one type. Uh, observables, while mapping over or produ producing values, they can throw an error, and they will call you an error callback that you optionally gave it when you created that observable. Signals don't produce errors. Uh, if a signal is capable of doing something like an error, the, the value it returns will use a maybe in some way, but there's no errors with signals. And then finally, something that they actually have in common is uh, they're chainable. So with observables, you can call map and scan and reduce, and signals you call map and fold and all the other uh, operations there. So observables, again, those are the arrows coming out and the arrows going into there. Sorry, yes, observables, but signals are the, the arrows in this diagram. And so in order to introduce this concept, the, I found the smallest possible FRP example that I could possibly find. So uh, you see the example on the right here, I move my mouse around and it displays some span uh, in that page. And if we look here, mouse position, that is the arrow going into my application. Uh, show is basically the, the body of my, func of, of my main application, so the data trickles through. And signal.map works kind of like array.map, so every time this signal uh, emits a new position, it'll pipe it through show, show returns an element, and what we get from main is a signal of elements this time. So that is the reactive part uh, of, of Elm right there. So, that was, that was the smallest example I could find, so hopefully that, that made some sense there. Um, if we try to scale this up to more complex, complex examples, we'll soon find that there's some common patterns. And what ends up happening is you create a sort of a signal graph that is common across your own applications. And so pretty much what you end up happen, having is like mouse and keyboard events and responses from the server. You pretty much have those all the time in applications that aren't games, basically. Uh, and so Elm gives us a module called uh, StartApp. And Startup, StartApp abstracts a lot of that away for us so that we don't really have to worry, worry about it. So um, this is a, a super simple forms-based example. So you can do HTML, buttons, forms, spans, flexbox, you can do the whole works. I wanted to show a more advanced example, but I didn't want us to be reading through code all day. So here, here's just a, a simple example of uh, moving a counter up and down. And if we look at the Elm application to produce this, we see main is calling start app, and it's asking for what's our model, what's our view function, and what's our update function. And you can just kind of glance through this and see what it's doing. Our, our model is a simple integer. Our view function takes the model and renders it based on what the current value of that model is. Um, we have click handlers on these buttons that emit some kind of action. Uh, and these are the kinds of actions we can emit. And when an action is emitted, we have an update function to handle that. So if we have increment, we return a model plus one or a model minus one and so on. And so I know this may not completely make sense on, on the first, uh, first pass here. Um, my goal is to kind of capture your curiosity so that you can, uh, after this talk, go on and look at the details of Elm. Um, but you don't even have to learn no Elm that well to, to add functionality here. So if I want to add a reset button, uh, I'm going to add a new button. Here's the text. I'm going to give it reset. There's going to be another action called reset. Uh, so I need to define that reset action down here. And I need to also handle that down here. So I can call reset. And I'm just going to return zero. Back to Charlie on line 22. Thank you. Well, will the compiler tell me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, rest. <laughs> Spoiler. God, Sandy. Oh, another one. <laughs> Oh, cool. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's odd. 
Yeah, I won't let you put JavaScript in the own file. Neat. Alright, so you see I add, added up a six and click reset. So, like I said, you may not completely understand how it works, but it's very easy to just plug into it and, and play with it. Alright. So, enforce semantic versioning. Uh, if you've ever had NPM, an NPM module that upgraded like a patch version and it completely broke your entire application, you know how much that sucks. And you don't get that with Elm because Elm has a tool called Elm Package. This is right after, right off the GitHub page. You can contrib contribute Elm modules to the, to the community to do whatever you know, Elm functionality, functionality you want. All packages start at version 1.0, so there's none of this confusion of 0 0.14 to 0 0.15. What does that mean? Is that a breaking change or not? You start at 1.0, and then depending on how your file changed, Elm package will automatically bump either the patch minor or major version for you. Uh, so that's awesome. So if you have breaking changes, it'll be a major version upgrade. Uh, if you have, if it's backwards compatible, but you added new things to the API, it's a minor change. Otherwise, if the API is identical, but the underlying functionality is different, then it's a, it's a patch version. So it's, uh, I'm, I was hoping to see more smiles because this is <laughs> such a pain uh, with NPM sometimes. So are you saying that it automatically figures out whether it's a major, minor, or patch difference? Yes. How does it do that? Because it knows the, the signature of the API that you're exposing. Okay, so it's just based on the signature? Yes. Yeah, and the, and the types and the signature, basically, yeah. Okay, so I want to switch gears real quick and, and jump back into JavaScript. Uh, I'm going to describe, uh, kind of with, with some shame, how I do debugging in JavaScript today and, and what that feedback process looks like. Um, the feedback, the, the iterative feedback loop uh, within the debugging. So. Uh, I pull a story off the backlog and I change some code after I understand what, what it is I'm doing, maybe after talking to my designer. Uh, and the next thing I do is I refresh the browser. And I do that because on my project we don't have Webpack hot module re replacement working yet. And so uh, I refresh the browser, which means I probably have to log in and requeries my local database. And so I kill a couple seconds there. Okay, not too bad. And what's the first thing I do? I look at the console and see if I did something stupid, like undefined is not a function. And if I did, crap, I did something stupid, go back to the code and, and, and fix it, right? Okay, so then I got it working. Now, what's the next step? Well, it depends on if I'm trying to make something look correctly or behave correctly. So if it's something DOM related, um, okay, I can ask the question, uh, does it actually look correct? If so, I'm amazing at CSS, don't let anyone tell you anything different, and we're moving on to the next task. Um, if it doesn't look correct, I'm singing a slightly different tune about CSS, CSS, and I'm opening the DevTools Elements and Styles tab, uh, editing those styles right there because it's a very quick feedback process. I don't have to refresh the browser, and I'm, I'm updating the code, my code base, to, to match what I just did in DevTools. So that's the, the CSS side. Now, what if I'm doing working on some bug or some feature where there's some behavior I want to verify? Step number, I guess, two, four, whatever it is, uh, is recreate the state. So depending on the bug or feature, uh, this could be logging in or logging out, maybe multiple times, uh, log, uh, navigating to different pages, maybe multiple times, uh, filling out forms uh, multiple times. So it really depends on the feature here. And after all, doing all of that, I look at the console and say, okay, in doing this, did I run any new branch of code that I just did something stupid on? If so, I'm an idiot, I'll set some breakpoints, I'll add watch, watch expressions and try to figure it out. In all likelihood, I'll have to refresh the browser so that my breakpoints hit and I figure out where I was really lazy at and it didn't do a good job. Um, so I go through the whole process again, recreate the state, and I'm finally at the point where I can ask the question, okay, is it behaving the way I want it to? And if you look at how many hops it took to get to the question of does it behave correctly, um, and usually it's, I went through here, and I went all the way around again, and then I got another error because I, I'm, programmers are lazy. I am super lazy, and I get console errors all the time. So it doesn't behave correctly. Crap, it doesn't, because I just did some logic error, right? And so um, go to DevTools, fix it, and finally I get to the point where I, where I fixed it. So again, I'm admitting this with some shame. Uh, there's improvements to be made here. Uh, but I'm going, what I'm going to describe is, is how Elm uh, shortens up this feedback loop so I can just change code, see what happens, change code, see what happens. Um, so we can already see Elm helps us in a couple of ways. For one thing, uh, the console error boxes are gone. Uh, for the most part, Elm won't stop you from overflowing the stack or dividing by zero. That's on you, but 
99 percent of the errors are are not that, so those are, those boxes are effectively gone. Um, the virtual DOM kind of helps with this, and that you can describe what you want uh, your program to look like rather than manually, imperatively uh, manipulating the DOM. But what about this loop? How does Elm help us here? And the way it helps us here is with our our time travel debugger. And Elm calls this the, the tool is called Elm Reactor. And so some of you saw this in the the lightning talk I posted. Um, but I'm going to show it here because it's awesome. So let me comment that out. All right. So we've got Mario. So here's Mario jumping around, right? And you see on the right side there, if I move left and right, left and right, the arrows updates, and uh, I've got a watch on Mario, so you see his position updating and, and all that. Um, and you see this number up here at the top that, that's counting up. Uh, our Elm applications are state machines, and this is how many states our application has been in so far. And the reason for that is because this is a essentially a simulation, and there's this signal, this input signal down here called FPS 25. If I can show the whole thing, oh, I did bad. There we go. FPS 25. That is a time signal coming into our application that emits a new time delta 25 times a second. So that's why that's that's counting up so frequently is is because of that time signal. The kinds of applications that we're doing, if you're not writing a game, they're probably on the order of tens of, of actions being displayed there. Um, so because it's a state machine, you can rewind this and it'll replay the state at where you were at that point in time. So that's that's pretty neat. If you found a bug, you can kind of go before and after it and, and look at what's going on there. Um, because this is actually a, a 2D visual example, you can trace Mario, and again, it'll show you where Mario was, is, is and is going to be throughout the lifetime of the application. Uh, what's more is to, to tighten up this feedback loop, uh, is you can edit these variables in line here, and it will update the application. So here's a constant that affects gravity, and if, as I change it, it'll replay the application with all the inputs that came into it, but with the new code this time. And now you can see how Mario would have reacted or is going to react uh, to that new code. So it's, that is an extremely tight feedback loop. And you can do this uh, as long as you don't make some crazy breaking change, like completely remove gravity and, and right, do something crazy. But for the most part, a lot of our, at least a lot of my debugging is tweaking little values. Oh, I forgot to do this here. Um, so you can imagine maybe like a forms-based application uh, where you're, you're validating a form, for example, how this could maybe be useful. You don't have to re-enter in all your data again. Um, so anyway, I, I thought that was really neat. You can actually do this in JavaScript-like frameworks. I, I mentioned Cycle.js. You can do this in Redux uh, uh, with one caveat, uh, as long as you're disciplined, right? So as long as you use, you use immutable data and unidirectional data flow and all that, you can do this sort of thing in those other uh, JavaScript libraries. Uh, in Elm, you get this if your, Elm, your com program compiles. So that's just a, a, a neat feature there. Um, so anyway, oh, uh, one other thing. Um, I'd really like, I'll, I'll just broadcast this as a, hey, if you guys want to work on this, that'd be great because I want to use it. I would really like something down here uh, for like a QA type process. like. Uh, I don't know how your QA process works, but how I've seen it work in the past is someone is testing your application, uh, they find a bug, so they take a couple of screenshots, they do this huge write-up of, this is what I did to reproduce the bug, and I hope you can reproduce it, because you're going to be bugging me pretty soon. Um, and that, Okay, a few people are smiling, so I know at least some people have gone through that, because <laughs> also not very fun. Um, what I would like is a text box to say, hey, you have a bug at frame 391, because here I've reproduced it, and have a send button that serializes all the inputs and all the state and sends it to the developer, and they could just pull it up tomorrow, next month, next year, and re reproduce that bug unambiguously and, and troubleshoot it. So that's what I want. So if anyone can work on that, that'd be great. If I, if I find time, I'll, I'll see if I can work on that too. Okay, uh, so to keep things uh, kind of quick here, um, there's a lot to cover in the Elm language, and I just can't do it justice within you know a 45 minute period. Uh, you probably you're probably wondering how do you do HTTP stuff because I didn't talk about that at all. Uh, and the answer is it has something to do with tasks, ports, and startup, uh, advanced uses usages of startup. And I need like 
30 minutes to cover all that, and I don't want to bore everyone. Uh, everyone wants to go to B or JS after this. Um, so these are a couple more concepts that uh, we still have to go over. Um, also, the current version of Elm is 0 0.16, uh, which is interesting in a couple ways. Uh, one way that it's interesting is I am following the, the mailing list for the Elm development group online. And last night, the creator of Elm says, hey, next week we're pushing out version 17 and some things are changing. Um, so that was, it's kind of bad timing. If this was two weeks later, I could have accounted for that in the slides. The, the new concepts and the like, signals are kind of different now. So uh, that's just kind of the fine print of keep your eye open if you're interested in Elm. Keep your eye open for next week, version 17 and, and the changes coming out uh, there. Uh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, a caveat with the current time travel debugger is if you're using ports in your application, if you're using ports, probably because you're doing something HTTP related, the time travel debugger debugger doesn't work. But I'm not concerned about that because next week it'll be fixed. So uh, that's why I'm waiting to, to say that now. Okay, so here's some resources that helped me out to, to learn Elm. Um, like I said, uh, my goal here was not to teach you the language concept by concept by concept, but show you here's the value of Elm. Here's what FRP is, and hopefully to, to spark your interest in. Uh, maybe wanting to, to go and research this on your own and, and look at the examples on Elm's website. So Elm's website has uh, tons of documentation, tons of examples to, to look at. Um, there's Git books out there. Uh, the Elm Discuss Google group is, is really amazing. Uh, please be a good Samaritan and search for your question before reposting it. It's just throwing that out there. And then uh, two videos I'd recommend. Uh, both are by Evan Zablicki, which uh, he's the creator of Elm. Um, the one on controlling space and time, if functional reactive programming is something you have more of an academic interest in, there's actually different kinds of ways than the fundamental way that we talked about. For example, you could have a way where your data streams are, are dynamic. Um, so if that's interesting to you, then uh, that video is what I'd recommend. Uh, in this last video of user-focused design in Helm, uh, if you're still not quite sure why, why a compiled language, why not just a library for JavaScript, that does a very good high-level discussion of what the goals and the scope of, of Elm are. Um, so this presentation is, is posted online. Um, I will post a link to that on the, in the comments section of the meetup if you have any questions or yeah, if, you, if you wanted to look at that. Um, but otherwise, that's all I had to share today about Elm. So are there any, any other questions? Yeah. Have you played around with um, getting Elm into Webpack 2 to try out their tree shaking to see if it works? Is it Webpack 2? Yeah. Uh, I have not. I know that there is an Elm Webpack loader. Okay. I don't know what versions of Webpack it's compatible with. Um, okay, because I, I tried that because I love Elm, but I don't like the fact that it's a 360k runtime that you're loading. Sure. So I was curious if you had played with trying to get that down at all. I have not tried that yet. I, I, I stick to Elm Reactor because it does the hot mod <laughs> um, And Webpack doesn't have the time travel debugging part, so th there's some trade offs there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I haven't tried that. That's not a question in the back yet. Um, for that HTML example, is that like some kind of templating language like JSX or something? Or what was that? That was Elm. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, under the hood, it's I think it's the it's virtual, DOM. virtual DOM library, yeah. Um, but it, it masks it with Elm's version of, of that. So yeah, I don't think virtual DOM has collage, but, right, but, but Elm does. But you get the same performance benefits as that virtual DOM library. How, is, how easy is it to use other JavaScript libraries with Elm? So that gets into the idea of ports. And so just a brief description of what that is. Uh, have you ever used a web worker? Um, you have some, uh, some entry point in Elm and some entry point in JavaScript where you are emitting messages across the wire, right? And the, you emit messages back. That's how you talk to JavaScript, is you emit messages. And so if you want to perform some function, you emit a message that maybe has a type. It's kind of very Flux-like, very Elm-like, right? It's emit this message on the JavaScript side, uh, it accepts that message, and it knows what to do with that message. Maybe it means call some function, maybe it means 
uh, call out to some API, um, and it goes backwards too, right? So you can email a message from JavaScript that gets ported into a, through a signal into Elm. Does, does that make sense? Kind of. We'll just it, it's message passing okay. is is the the high level version of it. Yes. So you showed us lots of kind of toy examples. Mm -hmm. What are some larger scale applications or other things that you've made in Elm? What that do you made? know or that you know of? Uh, I'll stop both. I'll do both. <laughs> um, uh, here is one large scale application is the Elm website itself. It's built in Elm, right? So you can go to uh, like Docs is a good one where you can jump in here. And you see, yeah, Elm can do all the, the, the kinds of styles that you you think, right? Uh, bonus is down here. Uh, you can't read it, but there's a check it out link. It's on GitHub, so you can actually pull this down and, and build it. Um, an example that I've built, so uh, this is, well, let's see if I can find it here. Oh, uh, mine's way quicker. This is what I built. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's, these are buttons. Um, let's see if I remember. So I didn't change the random seed, so this is why I'm awesome at this right now. <laughs> so I played this, played this a few times. Um, so those are just two examples. I know it may not be what you're talking about. Oh no, this but is, that's great. I was really curious to see if I can get, I think somewhere up here there's a zero. I'll look at that. Uh, I was really curious to see if I can get that to work where you click a zero and it automatically expands to your cells. Um, so those are two examples of that, that I'm aware of. No Red Ink is the company that is sponsoring the language creator and their entire product is built in Elm. So. I don't think it's their entire product. Dreamweaver, which is one of their developers' side projects, is written in Elm. Uh, I think they are using Elm in production and actively porting their JavaScript parts of their application into Elm. Okay. Um, I thought they had finished. Uh, they may have. Uh, yeah. I haven't kept up with them in the last couple of months. What are the compile times like? The compile time? Uh, it's as fast as you saw it up there. <laughs> right? But you're probably talking about like full-scale applications, right? And it, it's, it's not like, you know, Java or, you know, it's, you don't have to wait. It's, it's seconds. Right? I, I don't think I've ever had to wait more than a couple seconds to, to compile an Elm applica application. So, but again, this is my experience with Minesweeper, right? So it creates a, a thousand cells that have numbers and some logic behind it. Um, I have not tried pulling down the actual Elm website and, and, and building that. Uh, I assume that would take more than seconds, so I guess I'd be better off saying I don't have a better idea of a full-scale application. Um, so I'll just I'll backtrack and say I don't know. <laughs> that, that way I don't get myself in the hot water because I haven't built a full Elm website um, as big as elmling.org. Alright, looks like that's all the questions, so thank you everyone. So I think Nick has an announcements? Yeah. Some announcements?